seed-bearing plants. God spoke, swarm, ocean, birds fly through the sky over earth. Earth, generate life. Every sort and kind, cattle, reptiles, and wild animals, all kinds. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image. He created them male and female. The two of them, the man and his wife, they become one flesh. Well, it is February, and welcome to a series all about relationships. And if you're new here to Sun City Church, then you might not know that every February we take just time and we look at the Word of God for what it is that He would teach us about relationships. Whether you're single, married, whatever season of life that you're in, there's so much there for God to speak to us about. And I, I know that when it comes to relationships, it's one of the most complicated things that maybe we could talk about in church. I think we have to avoid the place of being cliche, oversimplified, kind of reducing it down to things that aren't really helpful when we're talking about just complication inside of our everyday reality of how do we live this life God's called us to. And on the other hand, I think we also have to understand that we have a temptation to drift into a place where we are living out a form of godliness without any power. And so that form of godliness is that we're in motion, kind of living out that Christian reality like Pastor Ginny was talking about, and there's nothing behind it. The Spirit of God is not there. We're not actually following in all the ways that he's called us to live. And if somebody was to maybe look at our life, even though maybe we attend church and we are part of a small group, they might not see any difference in the way that we're living our life and functioning in our relationships from somebody who is not following Christ. So in this series and what we do every year, we just take time and we look again and we go, God, what is it you have to teach us about relationships? What is it that you would speak into us as a people about what it is you want us to live out? And it comes out of this place of, of moving to Sun City Church. You might have heard us tell the story because I think we revisit it every single year. Ten years ago, we moved to Spokane, Washington. Nine years ago, we planted Sun City Church. And when we moved here, there was this article that came across our desk, and I've never found it since, but it's fascinating. In the moment, there was this claim that Spokane is the divorce capital of the world. Nation. Nation. That would be quite something if it was the world. It was the nation. Even that is pretty impressive, actually. Not in a good way, impressive. Impressive in a not-so-good way, right? I don't know where it is now, what things look like, but for us, we just thought this is important enough in our world, we need to speak to it. It can't just be one of the things that sometimes we get around to every year. We have got to make it our emphasis. We are looking at the word of God. What does he have to say? We're inviting the spirit of God to lead us, guide us into this life that he has designed for us to live. So in addition, every year to whatever series that we go through is we host a conference, a marriage conference. You just saw the video for it called Sweet and Spicy. And really the whole idea of it is that God wants our marriages to be sweet and spicy. And they just tend to over time drift into maybe neither one of those at all. And God wants us to understand what it is that he has for us. Move into this trajectory. And I think it's easy to kind of you know, look for maybe a key, one thing from scripture that would just maybe unlock every situation we ever face when it comes to relationship. Instead, though, I've found that it's really a posture we take. It's a trajectory we set ourselves on that I'm going to be a student of the scriptures. I'm going to be a student of the spirit of God. I'm going to be a student of Jesus and the ways of the kingdom of God. And in that, there is continual keys that he gives us that unlock specific things in our world and in our life. So we're just confident Sweet and Spicy is going to be a great time gathering together this year and just listening for what God wants to do. It's going to be on Saturday instead of Sunday. We've had it on Sunday in the past, but with three services, we've moved it to Saturday. We're bringing in a couple that I'm so excited to introduce to you. They've both written books. They just have incredible ministry to the body of Christ. And I'm really excited about what they're going to speak about in the area of relationships. So here's my 
plug on top of the plug you already heard, make sure you buy your tickets. Especially with a second campus, we just do not have room for everyone. So tickets are gonna go by fast. We would love it if you are able to be there with us and to try to fit as many people in the room as possible. Okay, let's get into this series. So here's what we've titled it this year. I'm so excited about it. Now, I said at the beginning uh, that really I was, you know, depending on you to bring your energy level in order to bring mine for this service. And then as I was worshiping, I realized that that's just not really true. I'm so excited about what I'm preaching here today. I don't really care what you do. (laughs) I love you. I think it would be way funner if you did bring your energy but I'm so excited about this series. Here's what it's called, From the Beginning, and we're gonna look at what God has to teach us about relationships going back to Genesis, and here's why. I'm gonna bring you into this moment that Jesus has with the religious leaders in his day, and this is a common occurrence for Jesus. The religious leaders would come to him, and they were constantly trying to present some kind of scenario in which he would have to answer in a way that would polarize the crowd and that the crowd would kind of splinter off and maybe walk away from continuing to listen to Jesus. And that's what they're doing in Matthew chapter 19. Let's look at it, starting in verse three. It says, some Pharisees came to him, Jesus, to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read? He replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, here's a little background that you need to know about what's happening in this scenario. First of all, I think that a lot of times we come to the Gospels and we come into these scenes and we bring our Western mindset with it and we just assume that these religious leaders are kind of dumb. Like, who are you to be coming and bringing questions and trying to question him? We've read the end of the story. We know Jesus is actually God. He's God in the flesh. He's going to die for the sins of humanity. And so because we know the end of the story, we kind of go backwards and go like, these guys are not very bright. They keep trying to trap Jesus and it's not working. But here's what I want you to understand about these religious leaders is these are not the kind of people that just show up at church every once in a while. They're not the kind of people that like, meh, maybe I'm in in this season of small groups, maybe I'm not. These are people who are committed to the study of scripture. They are serious students of God. They believe with all of their heart that they are following God in the fullness of what they understand about him. These are smart people. I spent yesterday, this is one of the geeky things about me, is I love theology podcasts. I like it in all forms. I like reading books. I love listening to podcasts. I love, you know, being a part of a class, whatever it is. I love learning about scripture. It's actually one of my favorite things in life. I was journaling just this morning, and here's what I was writing in my journal, is that lots of people dream of like going and visiting different places in the world, having different kind of experiences. I think that the coolest thing in the whole world is seeing something in scripture that I've never seen before. And every time it happens, I'm like, oh, I love this life I've been called to live. So here's how my day was yesterday, is I was cleaning my house all day long. It was busy the week before, I didn't get to cleaning it, and there was a lot to be done. I just put my podcast in, and I'm listening to theology podcasts, and I was in heaven. It was a really great day. I know some of you just can't even understand what I'm talking about right now. But for me, it was better than any spa, better than going out to eat. I'm just like cleaning toilets and listening to theology podcasts. I was like, this is, this is it. This is the good life right here. And as I'm listening to these people that are just breaking open the word of God, here's, here's how I feel every single time. Now, I love studying scripture. I've been studying it for a long time. I'm faithful, constantly, like in the word of God, every day on my own as a follower of Jesus, not producing things that are gonna be brought to the rest of the church, just 
as a student of Jesus myself, I'm in the word of God. But I sit there and I listen to these people and I feel so dumb around them. They are just like smart. They've been studying things. They know the Greek and the Hebrew and they're tying things together. I've never heard of before. And I'm just like, this is amazing. And these people, they are brilliant. And these are the kind of people that have come to test Jesus. They've come to bring their question, and here's what's going on. There's two factions within the religious leaders. One faction, one group of people, here's what they believe, is that a man can divorce his wife for any reason. She cooks the dinner in a way he doesn't like. Somebody else is more attractive. Remember, this is a patriarchal culture, so it's a one-way direction that this is going on. The man is divorcing his wife, and if she is a divorced woman, There is social and financial implications that make life very difficult for her. So one faction says, like, if he doesn't like the way that she is, let him divorce her. Here's the other faction. They're like, no, there is no way that God is okay with this unless there is unfaithfulness. So only in circumstance of unfaithfulness would somebody be divorced. And they're looking for Jesus to pick sides. That's why they're posing the question. Jesus picks sides, and then everybody is going to decide whether or not they're going to keep following you or not based on what you choose. So again, smart people trying to trap him. Here's his response. He says, why then? Here's them asking him first. They ask, did Jesus command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. Now, just pretend you're there in that moment listening to Jesus, really smart, study the scriptures your entire life. You think you know what God's up to and what he's doing in the world. Jesus responds to you, and basically here's what he says, is you are thinking too small. Your heart is hard. God has something that he is wanting you to understand, and you are missing it. And imagine for a moment how that sits with you. I think if I'm there in that moment, in their position, I'm kind of offended. I mean, like, Jesus, who do you think that you are? And of course, we know that they were offended, and they tried to kill him for it, and eventually succeeded. But here's the thing I want to draw out for you before we even get started in this series is that God comes to offend our way of thinking. And I just want to ask you, when's the last time you've been offended by God? Because there should be a moment. There should be a moment when you're opening up the word and you're looking at it and you're like, honestly, Jesus, that offends me that you said that. There should be moments when you're in church and the word of God is brought and you're like, and if there's not, then I have to ask the question, are you really following him? Because students of Jesus are being challenged to step into a place that they weren't before. Now, here's what else is happening inside of this moment. And I think that their cultural moment is honestly very similar to our cultural moment. Because prior to Jesus stepping on the scene, there has been a 400 year period of what we call the silent years. And in this 400 years, God has not been speaking through the prophets. So he had been, and there was always a prophet, there was always a representative. In fact, lots of times there was multiple prophets and they were standing up and through signs and wonders declaring, this is what God is saying. But it's been four years hundred years of silence. So God's still moving. There's still stuff that's going on, but not in the way that it was before. Their own rebellion, their own idolatry has led them into a season in which God's not speaking. And here's what I want you to notice. The moment God's voice gets quiet, the enemy's voice gets loud. And if the word of God's not being spoken into our lives, then Here's who starts filling in the gap. It's the enemy. And we know the way that he talks because Jesus tells us the language of the enemy is lies, confusion, and condemnation. He comes in and he just begins to twist things around. He comes in and he accuses. He comes in and he brings an agenda with him. And that agenda is the lie to still kill 
and destroy. And it just sounds a lot like the current state of our culture. As much as we're 2,000 years from that moment, man, there's a lot of similarities. We look around us and the culture around us is asking questions like, does truth exist? Like a truth that you discover that's bigger than us, a transcendent truth that God reveals, or do we get to just invent it ourselves? Truth's subjective and we each have our own version of it. Is marriage more than a piece of paper? Is it more than a way for the government to handle civil disputes? Is there a design and a purpose behind sexuality and sex? How are we supposed to live this life? The enemy comes in and he just says all kinds of stuff and it feels confusing and it feels chaotic, but I just want to point out to you, here's what Jesus says to all of them in that moment. He says, here's how it was from the beginning. And he points them back to Genesis. He points them back to the creation, the design, the purpose of God that is revealed. And so what we're going to do in this series is just follow Jesus back. Look at Genesis and what it has to teach us about who God designed us to be. So if you have your Bible with you, then open it to Genesis chapter 1. Of course, we'll have it on the screen, but I just suggest to you that maybe, especially during this series, you just bring it with you. And the Bible that you study all the time and you're highlighting and making notes in the margin, you have it with you so you can add, here's what God's revealing to us as a church community. I know I find it really helpful as I engage in just taking notes and leaning in as a student of God. So here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. We're going to come back to these words. And the darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, just like that that line in the song we sang just a moment ago, the Spirit of God was hovering. Let me look at this description of the earth for just a moment. The world is formless, and it is empty before creation. There's a darkness that is there, and the Spirit of God is hovering, but I want to point out to you that What we might assume that that means is not necessarily what the language, the original language, reveals. Because when we read that the world was formless and empty, we might think like, hmm, formless, empty. Empty like a blank slate? Like a world with freshly fallen snow and it's just endless possibilities? But when you look back at what the Hebrew says about these words, that's not what they convey. In fact, what it describes is a chaotic state of being, that there's chaos that's happening, that there is dysfunction that is taking place. And so instead of empty like endless potential, it is empty like a trash heap with no rhyme or reason. Like everything is disordered. There's nothing that is in a way that God wants it to be. And then here's what happens. The Spirit of God hovers, and then the Word of God is declared. And now, out of the formless and empty state of being, God brings form and fullness. There's form and there's fullness. And that's you. You are God's form and God's fullness that he brought out of the chaos. God introduced design and purpose along with creativity and beauty. And all of a sudden, that trash heap, it began to take on what we now look at all around us. And we go like, wow, look at the form. Look at the beauty. Look at the creativity. Even if we were to look at all the things wrong with our world, we can still see just the majestic beauty God designed all around us. And here's what I want you to understand about the creation account. We miss this because the Hebrew is translated and it's been translated actually uh, several times and we get it in our English translation and we miss a lot of the literary devices that are there. And the literary devices help us understand that when God brings us truth, it's not just informational truth like I'd like you to know this. 
I'm going to teach you that two plus two equals four. But the way that truth comes to us throughout Scripture is it's experienced truth. So he's inviting us not just to know it, but to experience it. And the creation count is no different. So in the original language, there is a pattern to it. There's a cadence. There's words that are being repeated. There's a structure to it. So it's meant that as the listener is listening to the way that creation happened, they're hearing it. Like all of a sudden, out of uh, like just sounds being played, that there's no rhyme or reason, just somebody pounding on a piano, like a child that gets a hold of it and just like banging on the keys. All of a sudden, there begins to be like a melody. You begin to hear it. And you listen to it. and Oh, this is beautiful. And it builds. And there's somebody that has designed it. There's something that it's communicating to you. That's what's happening in creation. So God designs a setting, and then he creates inhabitants, and then he gives them a purpose, and he does it over and over again. Setting, inhabitants, purpose. So he separates light from darkness. He creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, the inhabitants. And now there is time. There's purpose. We have the time in which we know and experience. God separates the sky from the waters, and he creates birds and fish, the inhabitants. And now there's air, and we breathe it, and we live. And now we have an ability to survive. And he separates the land from the waters. He creates land animals and humans. And now there is habitable space. There's plants for eating and ground for tilling. And then God completes creation with rest. And here's the purpose is now he's inviting creation into relationship with the creator. There is blessing. And why is this all important? You're like, oh, fascinating. But how does that apply to my life? Because you're part of the pattern. In fact, you're not just part of the pattern. God created humanity as the crescendo. It's the beautiful climax. It's the part that builds and all of a sudden God says and this is what all of it is about it's you it is the humans created in God's image now you have learned in school college just in the world around you that creation is a theory and maybe you've kind of looked and went like hasn't science disproven that now there's creation theory there's evolution theory but I just want to Without getting into all of the details of the debate, I just want to point out to you the difference in what is being taught in culture when it comes to evolution theory and the impact that it has on the way that we live life and what it is that God is revealing in Genesis and what Jesus pointed us back to. So evolution tells us, tells you that you were an accident, just happened to come about. And any purpose that you have in life is then a product of your imagination. You invent it. You create it. You're in charge of your own destiny. It's all up to you. Here's the difference in what God reveals to us through the Genesis account. It says that God is your creator. He designed you intentionally, and he has a purpose for you to fulfill. Now, and this is why it's important, and this is why we're doing a whole series on it. This is so important for us to understand because right now we are in a cultural moment that wants to say that formless is good rather than God's form is good. We're in a cultural moment, and this has happened all throughout human history, so it's not necessarily completely new, but we're trying to move back to pre-God hovering and God speaking, and we want the formless. We don't want the design and the order and the purpose of God. We want to invent it on our own. And we hear things all throughout culture like there's no design. You decide who you want to be. Live your own truth. Gender and marriage, they're just social constructs that inhibit personal freedom. Here's the thing I need you to understand is that if you reject God's form, you lose God's fullness. His form and his fullness go together. And you might ask, well, what is the fullness of God? Jesus came and everywhere he went, 
he brought the kingdom of heaven with him. And the fullness of God is healing, it is wholeness, it is freedom, it is righteousness, it is peace, it is joy, it is justice, it is mercy. It is the wisdom of God revealed in a chaotic world. The kingdom of God comes into our reality and it stands in contrast to everything else around it. He described it as it is light in a dark world. It's the fullness of God. And without it, life becomes empty. In fact, nihilism, its way of thinking and living, it's on the rise. And it's the rejection of all religious and moral principles due to an underlying belief that life is meaningless. There's no creator. There's no purpose. I should just do what I want. I should live for the moment. You only have one life. But when life loses meaning, people become apathetic and eventually they lose hope. And here's what we're watching in society, culture all around us is anxiety, depression, and suicide are on the rise. All the effects of this way of thinking and believing. Jesus points us to something very different. He said, from the beginning, it is not this way. So here's what we want to do. We want to go back to Genesis and go, what is it Jesus was pointing them to? So in Genesis 1.26, here's the creation account. Here's what it is that it reveals. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Here's what it reveals to us God created gender. He created humans in his image and he created them male and female. It's not an idea. It's not something we decide. God says, I'm the one who invented it. I'm the one who decided this is how humanity should be. And he didn't have to. He could have created sexless beings who all look the same. He didn't have to create any kind of distinction. Instead, he created them male and female, created differences in us. Not every female, regardless of whatever we see on the internet, looks the same. Not every male looks the same. God created creativity. There's brilliance in every single one of us. And when finished, he declares over his creation, it is good. It's good. Everything he designed, he looks at it and he says, this is good. Now, after that point, there is a rebellion. And the enemy comes in, having already rebelled against God. He tempts humanity, the crown of creation, into following in his footsteps. And man and woman rebel against God. And the purpose of God is thwarted. And the design of God falls into enemy hands. So that's why you do look around you right now and go like, God said it was good, but I'm looking now, and it is not good. I remember a friend of ours walking through a pregnancy. She has this little child in her womb, and that child in the womb, his organs were growing outside of the body. And you look at that and go like, this is not good. And we're praying, we're believing, and there's medical intervention that steps in even before that child took a very first breath and this is not good. This is not the way that God designed for it to be. But here's the thing that we have hope in is that Jesus came, he lived, he died. And what was he doing when he did that? He was announcing the redemption of humanity, that the kingdom of God was coming into our reality and all that God created to be good could be good again through him. Matthew 4, 17, it says from that time, Jesus began to preach and he said, repent 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've come to bring freedom. I've come to bring healing. I've come to bring relationship with the Father. There is redemption, and what is not good can be good once more. Jesus came to reclaim humanity and lead creation into restoration of form and fullness. There's order, there's design, and there's the life of God. Everything that he wanted us to have from the very beginning. So what was that purpose that God designed humankind for? I'm going to look at this briefly and we're going to go into it again next week. But here's what he, we understand from just this very first little bit of Genesis is that male and female were created to rule. God designed them to govern. He designed them to represent him. That's you. God designed you to govern creation. Maybe you've had that thought before. Maybe you've never had that thought before. Is that God designed you with the idea that you would represent him on the earth and you would rule, both of them, male and female. The purpose of rulership was given to both of them, not one without the other, but side by side as a team. And then God draws out this distinction in the way that he designs male and female. He starts in chapter two of Genesis and it says that God took man, put him in the garden, gave him a task, put him to work, said, here's the mission and the purpose of your life. And then he commanded him, here's the boundaries in which you're going to live this life. But then after that, God makes a declaration. And it's the very first and only time he says this about his creation before the fall of humanity. In Genesis 2.18, The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. He says, I will make a helper suitable for him. And next week, we're going to dig into what does that word helper mean? I think it's really easy in our modern English language to go like, hmm, I think I know what that means. But there is such depth in that understanding of what God designed male and female to function as. And we're going to look at it and unpack it all next week. But here's what I want you to know this week is that God created female in Genesis 2.21 as part of the side of Adam. This is significant. Man falls to sleep. God pulls out a rib out of his side, whatever the language is in that understanding. He pulls out of the side of man and creates a female. Here's what's communicated in that. She is his counterpart. She's not created like everything else. She is designed specifically the only thing that is designed that way. Female is created from the side of male, making her the counterpart to him. So we understand this. God created gender, male and female. And here's why, the purpose that he created them for, for relationship and for rulership. God put man and woman in that garden, and he gave them a purpose. And then that purpose got twisted by the enemy, and Jesus came, and he didn't come with a new purpose. He came to bring them back to the original purpose. Here is what God has been doing from the beginning. And the emphasis on male and female throughout their creation story is that they're similar to each other. They're unlike the animals, They're created in the image of God, both of them. Their purpose is to govern. They're similar, and yet they are distinct from each other. You might think about jumper cables, right? You have two cables. I have no idea which one goes where on a car. So if ever there's a moment in which I need to jump my battery, I'm calling my husband or I'm calling my dad. I have no idea what is happening in that. They both look the same, except there's two different colors, right? They're distinct enough that if you mess it up, it's going to be quite a result that you're going to get from that, right? It's not good. (laughs) And it's in the same way that God creates male and female similar and yet distinct and distinct enough that you need to know the differences because knowing the differences are going to make quite an impact on the way that you live life. It doesn't mean that we can create boxes and say, well, all men are like this. All women are like this. But there are ways that God has designed us as male and female. And for me, the story of my life is that I am a female pastor who ends up in lots of circles with all male pastors, 
all the time. I'm in all kinds of groups where I go, and I'm the only female there. And I can just tell you, like, some of the insecurity that that has brought in my life is like, oh, I need to think like them, talk like them. I'm like the representative of females everywhere. And there is just this, like, pressure that can come on me, and I've had to do my own work with the Holy Spirit of going back and going like, God, it is a good thing you created me, Jamie, female. And I don't want to be anything else. And I show up in the way that you designed me and the way that you are redeeming me to fill the purpose that you've given me in my life. And it becomes good when it is surrendered to you. Now, if you're single in the room, you might go like, well, I'm not married. How do I fulfill the purpose of God if you need both male and female? What's that supposed to look like? And marriage isn't necessarily the prerequisite for collaborative work. It's one of the ways we fulfill the template of God. So Jesus didn't get married. The apostle Paul wasn't married. There's single people throughout scripture and throughout church history that fulfilled the purpose and mission of God by being in church community. Sisters and brothers in Christ fulfilling the mission of God together. It's a great reason to join the dream team and be on mission with other people in the body of Christ. We always have it. Right after second service, we invite you today. Maybe it's your day to say, hey, I'm not going to just be someone who attends church. I want to be part of the church on mission, doing what God's called me to do. So God created you on purpose, and he created you with a purpose. And just in our last couple minutes here, I just want to give you some practical application. We've been talking about a lot of ideas, understanding, and packing the word, but what do we do with this? How does it matter to our everyday life? Here's the first thing I want to give you, is I want to invite you today to return to the creator. What does that mean? That means that you find your identity in him, that you become a student of the scripture, of God, of the spirit of God, and you let him teach you about the person he designed you to be, that you don't let culture press you into some kind of idea of here's what it means to be male, here's what it means to be female, here's what it looks like to live in this current day and age, here's what relationships are supposed to look like, that you allow God to have that role of telling you the way that he created you and the purpose that he wants you to live out with your life. You're not an accident. And you don't have the job of defining your own purpose. He has that. So here's the second thing I want to give you is that you would just embrace your value. And I look at the way that God designed us and all that's there in the care of the creation story to just introduce us to the understanding that there was a designer. And what it speaks to me is that there is great value in every single one of us as image bearers of God. And I just have spent a lot of time this week just in prayer going, God, for how much value that you have put into us, the kind of things that we've believed about ourselves, that we've allowed people to speak about us, the things that the enemy has crept in, and there's just this shame and condemnation because maybe, maybe things have become silent and the word of God wasn't telling us who we were. Maybe we were distancing ourselves from the people of God and we didn't have that conduit of the grace of God coming in and saying, here's who you are and here's the value and here's the purpose. And so the enemy crept into those spaces and we've believed him. And we've looked at our life and we just see the person staring back at us in the mirror and we've just felt a lot of condemnation and shame. And there's a lot of places where we've just looked and said, I don't know that I bring anything of value to the table. In fact, I just, I I was feeling this in prayer coming into this. And then I was in a couple of just prayer circles with our team before service. And this came up both times. And so I just, I just want to bring this to you. If there's been any thoughts of just ending your life, like I just don't even know that it's worth continuing on. Would you please come and find one of us? to pray with here today. It is a lie of the enemy, and it just came up several times today in in prayer as we were getting ready for service, is God designed you on purpose. Your life matters. 
It is not too far gone, whatever you've done or said or things that have happened. God can redeem anything that has happened in your life, and he wants to do that here today. Here's the third thing that I would just give to you as we wrap up here. If you're married here today, I think that this is the way the enemy works. I think he just gets into our thinking and our emotions, and he causes us not to really appreciate the difference that God brought to us in our spouse. And he created distinction. He created counterparts. And what we often do is want somebody to be just like us. I just believe the Spirit of God would come today to just awaken you to, I created someone to be your counterpart. And they're very different than you. And that can rub you the wrong way, and it can be so irritating, and it can be so frustrating. And yet, it is the purpose and plan of God. If you would, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes here today? And we're going to spend just a moment responding to whatever the Holy Spirit would bring up here in just a moment. But before we do that, I just want to give you the opportunity. I think when we come to messages like this, it can feel like, whoa, okay, this is, this is strong. I have to decide, am I going to be all in on what God wants? And I, I do believe that God leads us to those kind of forks in the road where he's not just the savior of our life, but we have to choose whether he's the Lord of our life. And whether we allow Jesus to offend us and teach us what we don't know, show us the way that we should live. So here today, if maybe you've been coming to church or you've just been kind of around, but you've never made the decision, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be a student of you. I want you to teach me how to live this life. I just want to give you an opportunity. And we're not going to call you out or embarrass you. We're just going to pray a simple prayer and believe that right here in this moment, God would just bring you into a different place of just relating with him and understanding his word and his spirit like never before. So on the count of three, if that's you, you just raise your hand and pray this prayer with me. One, two, three. Amen. God sees you. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and put your hands down. If you raised your hand here today, I'm just going to invite you to pray this prayer with me, but I'm going to invite all of us to just repeat these words and just commit again. God, you are my Lord and my Savior. And if you're making this decision for the first time, God's meeting you right here in this moment. Would you pray with me? Father God, I believe in you. And I believe in your son, Jesus, who came to earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for my sin. And right now, I confess confess all my sin before you. I ask you to wash me clean and make me new in you. God, I give you my life. I make you my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I could live a life that pleases you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone said amen. Let's celebrate with those who made that decision here today. Here's what we're going to do just in this moment. We're going to just respond to him. And I just believe the Holy Spirit is leading us into new revelations of what it means to be the person he's called us to be and how to relate with the world around us. And here's the way that we respond. We listen for the Holy Spirit. We have several spiritual practices. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we have our spiritual response survey. It's a few questions that just help prompt reflection as we move into the place, God, I'm building my life on what you say. We also have the cross. Maybe you want to kneel before it. God, I just surrender to you. God, I give you my life. I'm going to follow you wherever you lead. Maybe you want to receive communion. It's on either side over here. You just want to remember, Jesus, you have invited me into relationship. Based on your death, your sacrifice on the cross, you've invited me into community and communion with you. Or maybe you want to pray with one of the prayer team. And maybe there's something that just came up for you where you just thought like there is some lies I've been believing of the enemy, some things that he's just been hounding me about. There's been an insecurity or shame, something that I just want somebody else to pray with me. I'm not walking out of here with that lie in the back of my head. I'm walking out with the freedom and confidence that I am a son and daughter of the most high God. So I'm just going to invite, or I'm just going to pray real quickly. 
just inviting the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And then we're just gonna spend a few moments responding to him before we leave here today. So Holy Spirit, would you instruct us, teach us, lead us into all truth. God, would you order the path that we should walk on God, that we might live lives that honor and please you and experience the fullness, God, that you came to give us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.